um, and and science, why this case is important, why it's important to allow this medication to continue to be available. Um, you know, the, this the case may have been brought to the court based on ideology or opinion, but that's definitely not how it should be decided. So I see my job as a comms person to advance uh, the science and the reasoning behind issues like this. So it's part of what I do here. So I want to move on and introduce the rest of our panelists. Um, our first panelist joining us is Emily LeBear Warren. Uh, she's the director of the Health and Science Reporting Program at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY. Uh, she's a longtime science journalist, and her articles have appeared in the New York Times, Newsweek, Psychology Today, uh, just to name a few, and a couple of those articles are in front of you. Uh, our uh, next panelist is Javeria Shahab. She serves as the president of medical education at 21 Grams, the promotional medical education agency of real chemistry. Uh, in this role, Javeria oversees the agency's promotional and medical communications activities. And Javeria has a history of working in the healthcare communications industry um, with demonstrated success for over 20 years. So very happy to welcome uh, Javeria and Emily. And, um, our last but not least panelist is Oscar Gantua, who serves as the Digital Market Marketing Associate for Community Healthcare Network's Teens PACT program. Uh, with a background in public health and digital filmmaking, Oscar is dedicated to contributing to healthy societal perceptions of sex and sexuality among young people in New York City. So welcome to all three of you. Um, I'm going to, actually, I'd like to give you all an opportunity to share uh, projects that you're each working on and involved in um, that reflect your communications role in public health. So Emily, would you mind starting us off? Sure, uh, thanks so much. It's really nice to see such a huge group of people here fighting. Um, and I love the Reproductive Justice Hub. I think it's such a cool idea. And I love that um, the school is not shy about advocacy being part of what you do because I think that sometimes that gets you know seen as something you know that's not science or whatever so I love how you're integrating those things um so yeah so I I have a, a practicing health journalist and I also as you mentioned I, I teach I, I'm, I direct the health and science journalism program at the, the graduate school of journalism here at Kenny. Um, so my ulterior motive is to try and lure some of you to either take my health journalism class or um, matriculate and become a health journalist, you know, and go through our entire program. But I know you're in school now, so or whatever. So, you know, maybe you've been through it. So just kidding. But, uh, but honestly, you are welcome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so yeah, there are a couple of articles that I shared that um, Samata was kind enough to print out, which no one does anymore. Uh, um, so the thing about health journalism is I, I look at it very much from a public health perspective. I'm really interested in intersections between mental health, and physical health and social issues. And that's very much also how I kind of plug my program within the J school and how I, you know, a lot of the students that end up deciding um, to focus on health as a J school, they don't come in thinking they want to do that. They come in thinking, oh, I want to do urban, I want to do national, I want to do business, you know, but then when they start thinking about it, they're like, wow, it's true. Like most of the issues I'm interested in, whether it's addiction or um, incarceration or gun violence, like these are all public health issues. And then they start going like, oh, oh that's interesting, you know, and then a lot of them will come over to my side. <laughs> and, and what I think is really, you know, awesome about it is that, um, so I start my class really with what you already know, right? So a lot of them do not have a background in, like, they don't know about studies, they don't know how to find them, they don't understand, like, the basic, you know, sort of very, very basic epidemiological concepts, because I don't, I, I don't, you know, know a ton either, but I give them, like, the basics, and it's amazing how much that can elevate journalism, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, where you, you know, you read an article, or you see something online or whatever, and you're like, wow, this person like literally had no idea, like, you know, how science works and the bigger <laughs> they are covering health, right? So I just gave them like the basics of that. Um, so I guess um, the, the articles that, that are here, I don't want to know, but the articles that are here, one is on ageism and one is on circadian rhythms essentially. And what I think is really fascinating is that, you know, what the circadian rhythm one, which is about like, you know, um, 
basically people being allowed to work when their natural, you know, sleep healing cycle, you know, is best for them. Um, what I find really, you know, interesting and wonderful about being a health journalist is that you can just follow your interests and, you know, find those places where people can really relate to it. I mean, everyone can relate to that, right? We all have had that experience of the alarm clock going off and you're like, oh my God, like I can't believe it work. Right. And and the thing with ageism too, I got very interested in ageism, not just because it's, you know, it's terrible. I'm getting older and it's, you know, it's, it sucks, right? To like have to deal with that in medical settings or at work. But actually there's this really interesting research showing that um, the ageism that we internalize and feel towards ourselves can make us sicker and even take years off our life. And there's this really amazing researcher at Yale, Becca Levy, who recently came out with a book called Breaking the Age Code. And she spent her whole career looking at the health impacts of ageism, not just internalized, ageism that we, you know, also receive from outside, but also that we feel towards ourselves as we get older. So I just think it's really interesting that these things that feel like every day are common, they can really have like very intense, like physical and mental like impacts on people. So I will stop there. <laughs> I love that. Um, yes. Okay. Hopefully, I'm not going to get my PowerPoint slides, guys. But <laughs> you know, even that we're comms professionals, you know, it's one of the best tools that we have. So I'm going to take you through just a couple of slides about what 21 grams is. Um, so before I do, who here is in the CUNY public health program right now? Okay. All right. And then everybody else was just very interested. I love that. That's cool. <laughs> Does anybody here know the scientific folklore of what 21 grams stands for or how it might be relevant? No. Okay. Awesome. That's what I like to hear. Yeah. I get to tell you guys a fun story. Oh, you do? 21 grams of your body when you die? Oh, yes. <laughs> I wish I had prizes. Damn, I should have brought swag. I should have brought swag. That is... There is a that is about <laughs> drugs. <laughs> that, that, yeah. When I told my parents that I got a job at 21 grams, they're like, what say what? <laughs> like, but so 21 grams, there is the movie as well. It's all I think they also relate back to the the weight of the soul and stuff, but basically what it is is there's a guy in Massachusetts, a researcher, the turn of the 20th century, a guy named Duncan McDougall, and he wanted to go about uh um basically proving the weight of the soul or the spirit. Mm -hmm. And so what he thought was super rigorous, he decided to take a bunch of patients pre and post mortem and weigh them and found that the average weight loss was 21 grams. Mm -hmm. And so he attributed that to your soul or your spirit. And at the time it was like a big, you know, breakthrough. They published it in the New York Times. It was no Emily article, but you know, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Seriously, I'm not sure that it would uh, stand up to the rigor of today, but it became the scientific folklore, right? Of like, what is 21 grams? It's your soul, your spirit. Um, and so what better name for a pharmaceutical advertising communications agency than 21 grams? And that we like to, we, we, we try to think of this as like our philosophy, our approach, the way that we come at everything of like, how do we actually bring the soul and the spirit back to what we do and back to healthcare? So uh, this is just another, fun little way that we like to think about uh, healthcare is that we live by a simple belief. Medicine can can change people's lives. Jordans just go on your feet, right? But why is it that sneakers make people feel so much and healthcare doesn't really make you feel anything? Mm -hmm. And by the way, when they have sneakers, they're not telling you about the rubber soles. They're not telling you about anything else. They're talking about how it actually makes you feel. Whereas healthcare, we lean into the efficacy, the safety, all this other stuff, right? But how do we actually take healthcare and create something that makes people feel something so that they actually retain it and apply it and all these other things as well. So simply put, we like to focus on the 21 grams that make people tick. And we like to think of medical communications less as less of an interruption and more as a welcome because it actually gets you. So how do we get down to the actual, to the actual like imparting of, of education and stuff. And so my, part of my remit at 21 Grams is that me and my team are responsible for educating physicians, nurses, and healthcare professionals. And we do this in a world that's like you're inundated with information, it's clinical data overload, there's constantly stuff that's coming out, there's articles, there's cases, there's all kinds of stuff. So how do you actually do this in a world that's constantly, constantly overwhelmed by decisions and, and information and stuff? And so 
you know, the big thing about education and healthcare communications is that you need to do education that actually relies on retention. And if you can't recall that message, it, message in moments that actually matter, mm -hmm. it affects your health, right? So how do we make this something that's memorable? How do we make sure that it's stuff that people can retain? Uh, we like to think that at 21 grams, we're not just, it's not a litany of facts, facts, right? We like to think of ourselves as narrative storytellers. We've been programmed since we were children to retain and recall stories and how they make you feel. So a lot of what we do is actually getting to that essence of how do you get people to care about something? You tell it in the way that's a story, something that's relatable, something that's you know memorable and unforgettable. Because ultimately at the end of the day, if you can't retain those those details, those life changing details, it we it it really can have like a massive effect on your healthcare. And a lot of these videos that you guys are seeing in the background are different pieces that we've done. This was a patient that you know went through the typical uh, you know process of googling their symptoms, trying to figure out what was going on, making sure that they went to their healthcare professional, educated on what they think their symptoms are, you know, trying to relate all of that stuff back to what his journey was. So it's it's really such a, a multifaceted world that we live in and, and we have to be able to communicate that in ways that re resonate with everybody as well. Oops, sorry. So the way that we like to think about our Gramsiness or how do we get to that, uh, to that spirit is that people are dimensional and so is our approach. Um, we do things called 21 grams dinners where we actually get together with the patients that are, you know, experiencing some kind of disease or potentially like considering a new drug and stuff as well, and really get behind, like not a market research room, not some stuff, you know, not some stuffy conference table or behind a zoom screen or anything like that, but actually getting into the essence of, of what really, what are the unmet needs? How does it make them feel? How does this have an effect on their caregivers or the people in their lives. And then also doing things like a day in the life. And I don't think Avery's here, but Avery who um, actually works with me and is the husband of Hannah who actually helped to put on this whole thing is one of our directors at 21 Grams. And he is just absolutely amazing. Came actually from the consumer world. So you guys will hear more about how all there's this intersection of advertising of all these people from different places. Um, and will go and, and does basically I guess medical documentaries or whatever. So like we'll go on errands with these, you know, with whoever the subject is, we'll spend an entire day with them. We'll go and interact with their families and stuff. And so really, really getting into the the nitty gritty of what actually makes things, uh, you know, Oh, Avery, there he is. Just talking about Avery. This is our director extraordinaire who's uh, taking pictures and stuff. I was just talking about a day in the life and actually Avery and one of our other investigative journalists that's on staff who worked for like 20 years at a, a 2020 with Barbara Walters and many other people, they actually like dig in and really go deep and spend a lot of time with patients and HCPs and understand what makes uh, that that story relatable, resonate and stuff. And then in addition to that, uh, Samana was just talking about real chemistry and how we actually have this whole kind of um, world of data and insights and how do we actually link all of that stuff together. And so I'm sorry, I know I'm taking forever. I'm just gonna show you guys a really quick video of some of the fun stuff that we do at 21 grams. Oh, there's no sound. You'll get a sense of it anyway, but. It's you on the bottom, yeah, right. The bottom right. Oh, Thanks. thank you for Go. noticing that. <laughs> Teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> All right, awesome. Hang it again. <laughs> Yeah. I wonder if Avery shot any of these as well.
Nice. And it takes a whole, you know, whole ecosystem of folks to make all that stuff happen. Oops, sorry. Um, so like uh, Emily was just talking about, we take we we come up with uh, solutions for our pharmaceutical partners and clients from clinical all the way to commercial. So there's many different facets of what you can work in. Um, and that's just a little bit about 21 grams. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I know I was only supposed to do three or four minutes. <laughs> no, it's okay. Hi, so I'm Oscar. <laughs> yeah. I do have a video. Yeah. And I would prefer y'all watch the video before I say anything. So shameless plug, on April 27th, we are having a menstrual equity summit in New York City off of 14th Street. There are flyers information that will go out to y'all. So if you have young people in your lives, definitely invite them. Essentially, we are a teens pact. We are a youth empowerment program on New York Community Healthcare Network. We have boroughs in every, we have clinics in every borough except Staten Island. And we're trying to bridge the gap in access to care. We realize that young people do not go to medical providers. And that's rooted in fear, specifically around like even trust, being able to trust doctors, nurses, providers. And if we're dealing with communities of color, we know that there's a historical reasoning for it. So our job is to make young people feel like they can go into a clinic or hospital setting and move with the energy of saying, hey, this is what I need, versus you're the doctor, you're the nurse, you know better than me. Um, but in order to get young people feeling this way, we have to train them. So last year, one of our collaborating partners, Dr. Natasha Ramsey, which we've nicknamed Dr. Auntie Tasha, came and held a workshop on menstrual equity. After that, she connected us to an organization called the Period Education Program. And they also came and did their own workshop. And it got us talking about menstrual inequity. And the young people decided that they wanted to do a donations drive. So we did a donations drive and we held an educational component to it. And then after the drive, we were like, what are we going to do with all these products that we have? Luckily for us, we had just started a partnership with the LGBT Center off of 14th Street, which is where the summit will be. And we thought that it'd be great to create a gender inclusive um, setting for this because periods often get really down to the language of women and girls and we're missing a whole spectrum of other identities that should be included in those conversations. So we decided that we were going to take this, this component of the video that you watched, the education that we've been doing and create period power. It's our summit that's coming up and we're going to component, 
complemented by giving away all the items we were able to raise through the donations drive to the young people in their care. We're adding workshops, they're going to be um, experiences, tabling elements, and at the end of it, we just want folks to take what they need. <laughs> Thank you all three of you uh, for sharing your work with us. I want to pose a question to everyone. Um, I'd like to know, when did you kind of see your work as public health work? Anybody wants to take it first? <laughs> 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 okay, that's a good question. No, it's only a good question. Um, I really think it was when I came to CUNY J School, because before that, I worked, I was more of a science magazine editor. And then I also taught journalism, but um, it was at NYU and all those students, they have a science health environment reporting program, but it was mostly scientists who were like changing careers. So they actually were scientists, I was not. And so it was, I was more teaching them journalistic skills. But when I came to the community school and was having a health and science thing, that's when I started thinking about, okay, well, first of all, how can I teach? I can't teach them everything about health. Like I, I don't know it myself. And you know, and then little by little, I started to recognize this thing that I mentioned before about you know how public health is really the key to everything. Like public health is awesome. I'm sure we all feel that way, right? But it's just it's it's everything about being human, right? And about living together in society. And so once that was like a click for me, and then I was able to sell my program to the students and realize even more about my own work and what it used to me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sure. Um. So. So for me, similarly, I feel like public health kind of like transcends all things, right? Like you can work in really any industry, and there's some aspect. I mean, we all just went through a global pandemic, right? right. So I think we all shockingly came upon the realization that everything has to do with public health and how we approach like the world and being able to like travel and being you know all all these things. Um. For me, uh, working in healthcare communications a lot of what we do is like being able to bring new options to patients, right? So we work with clients to, you know, work on their regulatory submissions to the FDA. We, you know, we help them uh, pick messages that resonate the most with, with HCPs, disease awareness, like all kinds of education and stuff. And so all, I feel like all aspects of whatever I do on a daily basis, even if it's making sure that you have the right materials for a exhibitor booth or the right swag or whatever the case may be, it all ultimately leads to public health and being able to spread the spread the knowledge and information further and wider. So yeah. There was never a moment where I questioned whether or not my work went to college for public health. And then I specialized in sexual and reproductive justice. And even as a young person taking it in, all I could think about was my background experience, how long it took me to even understand what reproductive anatomy was, the implications for reproductive health, uh, and then realizing that young people didn't have that access. When I came in, I was really thinking about, well, how can we make talking about sexual health feel scary? How can we have conversations around STIs feel casual versus I have a disease, I'm going to die. You know, how can we destigmatize the conversations that young people are having and empowering them to feel like there's something that they can do without waiting for a parent, without getting an adult or guardian's permission? So that onus was always just at the point. So I have another question for all three of you. Uh, in what ways can media and communications professionals in the public health space deepen their partnerships with the communities that they serve? I mean, for for us in kind of pharmaceutical advertising and stuff like that, a lot of your funding comes from your partners, which is the pharma companies, but a lot of times, so for example, um, you know, my remit at 21 grams is education and for HTPs and things like that, but then there's also a community engagement arm, which is like uh, developing patient ambassadors to be able to share like information about their disease or their experience or their journey working with patient advocacy groups, um, working with other nonprofits like the GDRF, which is like type two diabetes and stuff like that. So there's there's many different intersections where you can actually part, even if you're working in the private for-profit world, also intersecting with the nonprofit world as well and being able to, you know, you have common goals, common objectives. It's just how do you bring that, you know, those resources and the information together. So yeah, there's many, if, if you're curious, there's always, there's always ways. To, to dig deeper. Yeah. 
coming from a grassroots perspective, for me, I think it's always knowing the organization that I'm working with, brand identity and their voice, and making sure it's in alignment with the communities that we're going to serve. I want to feel like I'm talking to folks, I'm in conversation with folks versus, I'm here to save you, I'm here to, like, you know, I'm really not. Because what I've learned from the college is that I'm learning from folks as much as they're learning from me. In this case, it's the young people that we are serving. And in addition to that, asking yourself, do I need to be there? And why? Is it is it extractive? There's already a power imbalance because there is a helping people who need help gap that needs to be filled. So you're coming in and you have to move with like the cultural sensitivity and competency of the space. There is a lot of um, assumptions that we're already making, dead them, dead the assumptions because it's not going to help you serve the group. And then listen to their narratives. I think in public health, especially in academic spaces, we get really caught up with the numbers and the stats. Sure, that translates over when you're doing your work, but when you're in those community spaces, you're talking to people, and that needs to reflect the, in the ways in which you feel. Yeah, I, I, what you were saying is a similar, in a, in a different context of journalism, a similar idea. So basically journalism, like so many other societies, had like a reckoning in the last you know five years or so. Um, about sort of what's objectivity and who gets to tell whose story and blah, blah, blah. And so health journalism, a lot of that, and science journalism, it's like who's an expert, you know, and, and typically you'll see in like traditional journalism, there'll be, um, you know, there'll be the experts and then there'll be like the patients, right? And the experts know stuff and the patients suffer or they, you know, whatever. And there's like, you talk about like a power of balance, right? As a journalist, you're making these decisions about how you sort of represent people. And I think there's been like recently much more of an awareness that, you know, you can be an expert as a patient, you're an expert on your own condition, you're an expert on your experience, and that we don't have to have, you don't have to have a PhD to be an expert, and that you have to really, as a journalist, it's kind of like, there's such been such a hierarchy in how we kind of view the world and our sources, and it's really trying to completely like change that and, um, you know, see people as experts on their own experience. I want to open it up to questions from the audience. Anybody has uh, anything they'd like to ask? Yes. Um, I guess my question is, so we have like public health and XYZ, right? We have public health and communications, public health and arts, public health and advocacy, like all that. Um, I suppose, as if you are someone who has already been in the public health space and now is trying to get into, um, for instance, communications, you know, um, where, what is like, you know, your advice on seeking those type of opportunities? Um, public health communications opportunities are pretty rare, which is, you know, maybe the creation of, of, of um, an event like this, right? There um, aren't a lot. So do you go down the sort of communications route and just try to get communications, um, you know, get a footing in there and then have wiggle room? Or do you sort of stay in the public health space and wiggle, wiggle room your way there until um, you reach this communications um, component of public Having lived, I feel like, a couple of different, like, careers and lives and stuff like that, um, I think the, way, the best way to find what's going to give you bliss and a way to get into comms or, you know, something that you really enjoy is to just try different, not, not be scared to, like, try different aspects, right? Like, when I first, when I did public health, I went to NYU, um, I always thought I was going to go to the WHO or Red Cross or Red Cat, like I always thought that I was going to do like relief work or humanitarian. Like so I, I, I did that for a little bit, went abroad and stuff. Quickly realizing you couldn't afford to pay your rent in the city, you know, maybe doing some of those jobs. And I keep on calling my dad, be like, hey, yeah. but um, and then I actually did uh, uh, clinical research at some point. Realized that I didn't like the repetition, you know what I mean? And then it wasn't until I actually went to a job fair at NYU that I even learned about the world of medical communications or advertising or any of that stuff. So it's just about you, Isabella, coming to things like this, making sure that any of the people that you meet here, you, you exchange phone numbers with us as well. 
being able to like lean on that networking group and stuff. And so ultimately many of the places that I went from there or the, or the opportunities that I got were based on the people that I knew and somebody helping me or telling me about what they did or piquing my interest and stuff like that. So it kind of, it, it's, it's kind of like a, a ball of thread. You just got to keep on like, you know, pulling out pieces of it and seeing where it leads you. So, and not giving up, right? You're not going to find that job on LinkedIn, you know, ideals.org or whatever, like whatever the case may be. You got to just, you got to follow the, you got to follow the clues basically. So I don't know if you guys have the same, similar experience too. I mean, yeah. I would just add, yeah, that's, I mean, great advice. And, and I actually would say, I think there are a lot of jobs actually in, in public health comms it's about like looking at like because it, it crosses so many different areas right so there's you know working you know in communications at a place like you know a university a hospital or things like that but then there's you know working for an advertising agency or um you know uh you, you know, know policy or whatever yeah policy and then there's also a lot of um, writing for like pharmaceutical companies and you know all kinds. There's like a lot and there's a lot of money in medicine, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of and a lot of those entities need good communicators. So I just think that I think it's actually it's a pretty broad palette that you have to work with, and I completely agree that it's like you know it's not it's, it's hard to see maybe because you have to like it's so it's it's interdisciplinary. Area and you have to like kind of be open, like you're saying, like meet a lot of people and talk to a lot of people and whatever. Yeah. Let me jump in. Um, I want to put you guys on this idea that uh, you know your search or uh, public uh, comms and public health field, the field is interdisciplinary. I also think you should take uh, that approach to presenting yourself to uh, you know potential uh, employers on LinkedIn, etc. Look at your skills as uh, an interdisciplinary list of uh, what you bring to the table and you offer. Um, you're not just a public health professional. You're a science writer. You know, you're, um, don't limit yourself to a certain bucket just because that's how that's where you've been for the last few years. Or that, you know that's how you've been thinking about things. Um, Public health can be so broad. Think about how you can present yourself in a way that uh, shows that your skills translate across um, across industries. The other thing that what gets missing is that we are limited by what we can imagine for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know what jobs are even available, mm -hmm. how do you know what you're looking for? Yeah. Uh, something that I think is really cool to do is look at organizations that you're interested in. Look at who's on like their staff, their career openings. Mm -hmm. What do you like? Look at the job descriptions. Do you have those skills? Do you even want those skills? And I think that we get kind of like, I need this, I want this, and so I have to. And then we put ourselves in like jobs that we really need to have to figure out. And I really like what I'm saying about uh, skill building. I think we're in a space where education, there are three routes towards education. Uh, if you can think journalism or uh, communications is something that's inaccessible, inaccessible unless you go to a media school. Different sector has multiple courses. You know, like Sarah has multiple courses, and you're already paying a lot of money if you're in media school. Or how can you find free, free outlets to present yourself as I have as well? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Qualification about your article. Um, do, I'm just curious, like, are there any companies that reached out to you or, like, you know, implemented this um, this factor of like working during the employees, employers, um, or employees actually, they're sort of being really So you're interested in whether employers are actually working with people in this way? Is that what you have? Or like someone reached out to you after you posted this article, like, oh, this is this is really good. And like we we thank you because this is bringing productivity in our company. Um, it got a ton of comments. Like those are the comments I'm wanting to write. People had a lot of feelings about it. I didn't personally hear from the employers, but I do think it's one of the, I, I have written a piece previously about um, employers out there that are actually doing that, where they're actually um, 
uh, allowing workers to to basically they help them figure out what their most productive time of day is because everyone has their own circadian rhythm, their own personal chronotype, and they help them figure it out. And then they like arrange it so that meetings only happen like between like I can't remember, but it'd be like between twelve and three or something. You know, so that the morning people and the evening people would both be you know in decent yeah. shape to attend or whatever. So yeah, so it's it, it is a really fascinating area. Yeah, I agree. It's it's dirty. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, can I ask about money and corporation? So hopefully, Emily, you're above this in like journalism integrity. Um, but um, I think I think a lot about this, you know, corporations who have lots of money to get people to, you know, very dangerous tide pods based on psychological studies. That advertising is really dangerous and terrifying and especially in the world of like misinformation there's a lot of money going into what companies are doing versus what your work is Oscar to to get people to you know understand what they need to know and so I'm interested a little bit in kind of the back and forth between how do you as 21 grams as a seems like a very shiny fancy lovely organization <laughs> like like you look like you're like on it how does that yeah. how does that translate we have the Coca Colas and the Nikes and the like you know capitalist juggernauts of yeah. big pharma et cetera? So interestingly, and I'll start and probably add to this. <laughs> so when I was part when originally when I was first going to school as well, right? Like I was thought, you know, public health, like public good, grassroots, how do we do this? How do we get out the message? You know, typically you're looking for like funders and donors and, you know, it's it's a lot more kind of, pharma um, was the bad guy, right? Like that was like the dirty evil. You don't want to, you don't want to do that. You don't want to work in that industry and stuff. And then once you finally actually get into it and you start to peel away the different layers and stuff, the pharmaceutical industry is the most highly regulated industry that there is in the world, my friends. The 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 proof of burden to get any products approved, what you can actually say. I mean, Avery was literally at a meeting over the weekend where they were filming a video with patients and they had a regulatory guy on site with them where they were talking about how a patient support system, the person couldn't say that the patient support system helped them. It's like that specific because the patient support system uh, thing didn't actually help their disease. So it is so, so, so regulated as to what you can say and not say there's the burden of proof. Everything has to be peer reviewed. There's so many different um, barriers to like money, just being able to allow you to say whatever crap is on your mind. Pharmaceutical companies are regulated by the FDA, by pharma guidelines, OIG. There's, there's so many different places where Everything that you do from a comms perspective. By the way, if you do say the wrong thing, the fines aren't in the millions. The fines are in the billions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So it is. It is very much. I like to think of what we do as making sure that you're bringing fact-based, peer-reviewed, scientifically rigorous and accurate information to HCPs and patients. So you don't have to feel bad about it. <laughs> uh, working profit or nonprofit, whatever, with with the you know, uh, with a public health degree, which is something I had to deconstructed my own mind as well. So we are uh, out of time for this session. We want to thank our panelists today. There's a lot of information on the website for today's symposium. So if you want to connect with panelists, you can find us on LinkedIn, um, find bios, et cetera, on the website. And we Yes, thank you so much, everyone. Um, and thank you to our esteemed panelists for such an inspiring and informative session. And thank you all for joining us here today. Everyone's contact information is available on the Public Health Everywhere website. And we are now heading back to the auditorium for the afternoon keynote panel and closing remarks by Dean Ayman El Mahandas. Yeah,